Uh, this is lesson 18. Uh, and what we're going to start focusing in now on is um, that analytic geometry component of uh, what we're doing here. So uh, in grade 9 and grade 10, you would have been studying uh, you know, equations of lines, you know, even equations of circles, uh, points on the Cartesian plane. And then what you started doing is started looking at things like distances, creating lines or segments, which then can create shapes and you could determine areas and you can turn distances between two points, between a line and a point, all these things that are geometric in nature, but that you, um, uh, that you study, that you calculate using algebraic representations, in other words, equations. Uh, on a Cartesian plane. So we're going to start doing that now uh, in 3D. Uh, but just to give you a precursor of what's to come is in grade 10, in particular, you worked on solving a system of equations. In other words, finding the intersections of two lines. But then you realize that that uh, uh, tool was useful in solving questions that had nothing to do with geometry at all. You know, so you could use that same tool for finding the intersection of two lines to determine how much of each type of alcohol you put into a solution to get a particular concentration or uh, determining, you know, how much in each, uh, uh, each of two um, uh, savings plans you would invest in to make a certain amount of interest. So all these things that have nothing to do with geometry but whose solutions can be uh, uh, determined by using these things that originally came from just solving geometric problems. Well, guess what? You know, we're heading there, okay? And we're going to start seeing one of the, uh, you know, most useful um, uh, methods for solving equations, especially when you're working with multiple equations, okay? So just give you a sense of where we're headed, but let's start something simple. Okay, so here, the first thing I'm asking you to do is to think about some of these, um, um, some of these objects that we've defined in 3D, in particular, the line and the plane, and start talking about how they interact. So what I want you to do is, you know, take two pencils, two pens, and I want you to figure out what are all the possible scenarios in terms of the intersection of two lines in 3D. Okay, so now we're working uniquely in 3D, okay? And then do the same thing for a line and a plane, okay? So like I said, you know, you get yourself a couple of things that are straight that can act as lines and then get something that can act as a plane, even just a sheet of paper and a line. And I want you to consider all the possible scenarios for those intersections, okay? So I'll give you uh, whatever, maybe uh, two, three minutes and just try to quickly, you know, jot down or maybe draw um, a diagram to represent each of those scenarios. Okay, and if you have any questions, just again, use a chat. I'll give you a couple of minutes to work on that. Okay, folks, so we're back. So uh, let me use these two things as representing lines. So let's start uh, telling me what can uh, happen when we're, uh, when we're looking for intersections lines, what are all the possibilities? So, you know, think back to what you've got in 2D, what do we have in 3D? So who wants to start giving me some ideas here? Okay, so in fact, maybe let's start with the ones that are similar to what we see in 2D. And we see that, yeah, definitely, you could have two lines, okay, that intersect each other at one point, and we see here that, well, these lines are not parallel, okay? So they're gonna, they could intersect at one point, good. Anything else that can happen, okay? So they could be parallel and distinct where they have the exact same direction, but they don't share any points at all. So parallel and distinct, good. They could represent the same line, meaning there's infinitely many points of intersection, okay? That, you know, they may remember when it comes to uh, when it comes to a vector equation of a line. Sometimes they might look different, but they actually represent the same line. Okay, and now we've got a new scenario which we did not have in two D because in two D those were your only scenarios: parallel and the same collinear, okay, parallel and distinct, or intersect in a line. But now his bun's bringing up a fourth possibility is that they can be not parallel, 
but they don't actually have to intersect. Okay. So now when you're thinking about, you know, again, again, you think of lines as representing trajectories. Okay. So you could have two objects in space that are both traveling in a line, but they don't ever have to intersect. There's no chance for them to ever intersect. Okay. And so that's what we call skew lines. All right. So let's take a look and so I'm not going to draw them all out. We'll just take a look at what the, uh, uh, solutions are. Okay. So here, these are all the different possibilities. So for lines, they're parallel and distinct, or they can be what we call collinear. Okay. There's infinitely many points of intersection. They're essentially the same line. Okay. Now, what do these two scenarios have in common that the other two don't have? So let's keep in mind about what the relationships are. So what is special about these two scenarios that's different from these other two. Okay, so let's say it a little differently. So I think what you're trying to tell me is that the lines are parallel. So what does that tell us about the direction vectors? So let's start with the, set, the direction vectors. What does it tell us about the direction vectors? It's not quite what Andrea is saying. Do the direction vectors have to be the same? In fact, I don't even think they need to be equal or opposite. They just need to be parallel. Okay. So remember, I have a line. If I've got a line here, there's actually infinitely many direction vectors. You know, this, you know, there's a direction vector. There's a direction vector. There's a direction vector. Something going in the opposite direction is a direction vector. Okay. So as long as they're parallel. All right. So here we see that if the lines are parallel and distinct or they're collinear, well, they definitely are going to have parallel uh, direction vectors, okay? So you should be able to tell just by looking at an equation whether it falls under one of these two categories or one of those two categories based on whether the uh, uh, vectors, the direction vectors are parallel. Now, I do want to bring up, somebody talked about a normal, and this is where we have to be careful is that a line doesn't actually have a normal vector. Because when we think about a normal vector, we think of a vector in a particular direction. So when you've got a plane, okay, you've got a normal vector and every other normal vector has to be in that exact same direction, okay? Whether it's in the same direction or opposite, they're all parallel to each other. The problem with a line is that anything along this line is perpendicular to the original line but so is this one, so is this one, so is this one, so is this one. So there's no one direction for a perpendicular vector. So lines in 3D do not have normals. In 2D they do, but in 3D lines don't have normals. Okay, so actually it's good that that came up. All right, so now what about a line in a plane? Well, I guess I didn't quite want to show that yet. So what do we have with a line in a plane? Well. Who wants to describe the scenarios? There's my line, there's my plane. Who's going to de describe the scenarios here? Okay. Could be that the line is actually on the plane. Okay. So the line's definitely parallel to the plane, but it's not just parallel, it's actually on the plane. Okay. Let's see what else we have. We have one point, all points. Parallel, not parallel. Oh, so it looks like you're trying to, are you giving me all of them there? <laughs> okay. So the other option that you have is that the line is parallel to the plane, but is completely distinct. So they share no points of intersection. Okay. But as soon as they're not parallel, well, what's going to have to happen at some point? It's going to have to, you know, intersect with the plane. Okay. So remember, the plane goes on to infinity in every direction. So as soon as the plane and the line are not parallel to each other, eventually, you know, eventually it's going to cross through the plane. Okay. Again, a bit tough to show. This would be a little easier to show live. But, you know, here we have our three scenarios. Okay. The line and plane are parallel in these two scenarios in one case 
the line is on the plane, infinitely many points of intersection. In the other scenario, the line is parallel and distinct. And then as soon as the line is not parallel to the plane, at some point, there's going to have to be a single point of intersection. Okay. So we see that there's a lot of, you know, and again, this almost looks a little more like two lines in 2D, okay? Uh, whereas here, this has, you know, that extra bonus possibility in 3D that we did not have in 2D. All right, any questions on any of this? So how does this become useful? Well, you know, again, I'll give you, you know, this is you know one of many examples. I'll give you one that I think we can all imagine. This is the plane that represents the motion of the planets around the sun. And you have some object coming from, you know, outside of this, uh, uh, what do they call that? I can't believe I don't remember this. Uh, there's a name for this plane with the planet and the sun. It'll come to me later today, I'm sure. Okay. And you have an object that's coming in. Do you not want to know when that object is going to intersect the plane on which you have planets in the sun? Okay. So anytime you have some sort of object that's sort of traveling through some plane of importance, and I would say the plane that contains the planet and all the sun is very important, you want to be able to inter determine exactly where that intersects. Okay. And of course, when you're talking about motion, you're not just talking about the path that it's traveling on, you're also talking about the time at which point it's at every one of these locations. So you wanna determine, is it gonna strike that plane with the planets and the sun at the same time that the earth is going to be at that particular location, okay? And in fact, we're going to talk a little, uh, we're going to talk about that later on when we talk about the distance between a point and a line. We want to determine, you know, you've got the, the earth, you know, there's the earth at the tip of my finger and you have some sort of, you know, ast uh, meteorite or meteor, I guess, not meteorite, but meteor that's traveling. You want to know what's the closest distance it's going to get to the earth, okay? Um, in particular, you want to make sure it's not actually going to be hitting the Earth itself, okay? So again, those are all these sort of analytic geometry problems that you can then transfer to a physics scenario. So Ali, does that give you a bit of a sense as to why uh, that might be useful? Okay, great. Okay, so for now, what we want to focus on is how we actually determine these things here. Okay, so here, straightforward question, determine the intersection of the lines. Now, the one thing I want you to notice here is that I do not use the same variable, okay, in each of the lines. When I'm working with two different lines, I want to make sure that my parameter does not have the same name, okay? The reason being is that maybe the S value that produces your point of intersection in line one might not be the same value of the parameter that produces the point of intersection in line two, okay? And you'll sort of see as we solve this, why it's very important to not assume that the parameters in line one produce the same points as the parameter in line two. All right. So I'm looking for a point of intersection if it exists, presumably the, you know, the algebra will tell me whether it exists. What is the first thing you think I might want to look at when I'm trying to solve something like this? What is one thing that I might want to put my eye on before I really do any algebra? And think about all those different scenarios. We kind of group them together into two different, uh, two different groupings. So think back, there you go. I would start by seeing whether these lines are parallel or not. Why would I do that? Well, because it's something easy to do. And then at least I know I've narrowed it down to one of two scenarios instead of one of four scenarios. So here, if I look at you know M1 and I look at M2, say for the second line, I can just look at this. Are these two vectors parallel to each other? 
can you tell me really quickly whether they're parallel to each other? And they're not, you know, even if you look at this, this is negative two times the Z value. Three is definitely not negative two times two. So we have M1 and M2, okay? Okay, are not parallel. So right away, I know before I even start that either I have one point of intersection or there's skew lines with no points of intersection. That's, you know, that's nice. You know, would I have gone through this rigmarole if it was going to take me a long time to determine whether they were parallel? Probably not. Okay. Uh, I don't, you know what? I'm not going to go, I'm not going to say this is a universal symbol. So it's a really good question. I, I've, I've been using it intuitively all these years. I'm assuming, you know, at least one of my professors at some point used that symbol. But I, I don't want to say for sure that that's a, a universal symbol. It may very well be. Okay. So good question on that. So I'm looking for the point of intersection. So I want to know when these two vectors to a point on the line are equal to each other. But if I were to try to, yeah, if I would try to equate these two equations, Essentially, what is it that needs to be equal? So if I've got two vectors that are equal, yeah? So if I write, you know, R1 equals R2, and I actually equate these two vectors, what is it that's going to have to be equal? What makes vector A, B, C the same as vector D, E, F? Exactly. The components have to be equal. So that's why that, I think that suggestion of working with the components is going to end up being useful. So instead of working with the vector equation of this line, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with the parametric equation of the line. Because if I take the X component in my first, you know, what do I have? I have negative one plus three S. Okay, and then here my, uh, oops, sorry, my y component in the first line is 1 plus 4s. And then the z component is going to be 0 minus 2s, so negative 2s. And then here we have that x2 is equal to negative 1 plus 2t. Okay, and then we have uh, y2 is equal to 0 plus 3t. Okay, and then I have y3 is equal to negative 7 plus t. Okay, and in the end, what do I want? I want to determine when the x components, y components, and z components, and I just realized that should have been z. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mendiza. Just saw that. Okay, all these components have to be equal. Okay all these components have to be equal to each other. But this looks a lot like a system of equations. What is odd about this system of equations though? Because I need, you know, these to be equal, those to be equal, those to be equal. What's the problem or the issue with this system of equations? How is this different from our usual system of equations that we often solve? Well, I've got two variables, but how many equations do I have? Well, remember, I'm going to be equating these. So how many equations is that actually going to produce? It's going to produce three equations, okay? But I don't need three equations to solve two, okay? Well, let's... You maybe maybe Ali, you're getting a little uh, you're getting a little far ahead. So let's maybe uh, we'll we'll go a little slower here, okay? Uh, but I, the first thing I need to do is if I want to solve for an S and T, I only need two of these equations, okay? So once you have your parametric equations, and I have to solve for these two variables, okay? Which S and which T? are going to produce the same point on these two equations. If there is a point of intersection, we're going to choose two equations. Okay. So the first thing you have to realize is that you can only work with one at a time. 
All right. Now, when I'm looking at this one here, I kind of wouldn't mind working with this equality because the negative ones are going to cancel out. And I'm looking at this equality here, and I like that one because I have no coefficient in front of my t. Okay. Now, there's different reasons to use different equations, but the idea is that it shouldn't make a difference. But I'm going to choose one and three. Okay. So what I have here is I have that negative one plus three S needs to be equal to negative one plus two T. And then I have that negative two S has to be equal to negative seven plus T. And in fact, that first equation simplifies to that there. And now all of a sudden I have two equations and two unknowns. Those are things that I can check. Okay. So again, what would be nice is if you're kind of doing this and like, you know, try to stay a step ahead of me if you can, as I'm doing this. Okay. So here, I guess I'm going to multiply equation. I'll keep equation one as is three S equals two T and I'll multiply equation two by two or sorry, equation three by two. Okay. So what do I have? Negative four S is equal to negative 14 plus 2t. And now I'm going to subtract these two equations to get rid of the t's. Okay. So 3 plus 4 is 7s. 0 plus, minus 14 is plus 14. And the t's cancel out. So s is equal to 2. Okay. And now let's use uh, maybe equation 1 here to solve for t. So three times two is equal to two times t. Twos cancel out. There you go. t is equal to three. Okay. But, and let's think about why Ali made his, his suggestion there. This s and t that I found, does it make all the, co uh, the components equal? What I just solved, which components does it guarantee are going to be equal? There you go, X and Z. Because I only worked with these components, whichever ones I happen to work with, equal. I need to check that these values of S and T are going to make the Y components equal. And that's where we're going to see the difference between whether these lines are not parallel and intersect at a point or not parallel and skew. Okay. And I'm going to keep repeating this over and over again. But if all you do is find these two values, then determine your point of intersection. Even if there is a point of intersection, you get at most half the marks on this question. Because if you're not showing that the Y values are equal, it doesn't really show me as a grader that you really understand that there's no guarantee that because these values make the first and third equal, that it might not make the other equation equal, okay? So keep that in mind from a Marx perspective. Obviously, what we care about most is learning the material. But, you know, from a Marx perspective, if you don't do what I'm going to do now, which is check the Ys, you know, you are cannot get more than half the marks on a question like this, okay? So let's check Y1. That's 1 plus 4s, and s was equal to 2. So 1 plus 8 is 9, and then y2, which is 3 times t, and t is equal to 3, and that's also equal to 9. And so now I know that what we found, this value of s for line 1 and this value of t for line 2 are going to have to produce the same point, okay? So have I finished the question? What's left to do? What have I not done yet? Yeah, I have to actually find the point of intersection. Okay. Now, should it matter whether I use equation one or equation two? No, because I've set it up to make the first and the third components equal. And I've checked that the second component is also going to be equal. So it shouldn't matter which one I use. I'm going to do both once. I'm probably never going to do this again. But 
I'm just going to check just to be sure, also to convince you that this all makes sense. So let's check x1. What do we have? We have negative 1 plus 3 times s. So what do we have? We have negative 1 plus 6 is 5. Y1, well, I'm not going to check that again. We already checked that. And then Z1, what do we have? We have negative 2S. So negative 2 times 2, negative 4. Okay. And of course, folks, make sure you're checking my arithmetic here. So let's do X2, negative 1 plus 2 times T, which is 3. And that's negative 1 plus 6 is equal to 5. So I'm good. I like that. Y2 we already checked is 9, and Z2 is equal to negative 7 plus T. Negative 7 plus 3 is equal to negative 4. Okay, so that means our point of intersection. Okay, now here it's all about context. This doesn't represent point of inflection. Okay, now in this context, we understand this is the point of intersection. It is going to be 5, 9, negative 4. Okay, so in this case here, the two lines. We already knew we're in parallel. We now have established them as being, uh, as having a single point of intersection. Okay, so just to review the steps quickly. Okay, work with your lines in parametric form. Equate any two of the components. Solve for s and t, and then check for the third. Okay, if the third is equal, then you have a point of intersection. Go ahead and find it. If the third is not equal, then what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that there is no point of intersection. All right. So any questions on this before we move on? All right. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to um, work on uh, this one here, and then we'll come back and uh, take a look at intersections of a line and a plane. And of course, if you wanna move on, nothing stops you from moving on, okay? So let me give you about, uh, I don't know, three minutes, four minutes to work on number three, and then we'll come back uh, together and finish this off. All right, see you in a little bit. All right, so we're back. Uh, so, you know, I look at this here and I see that again, these are not parallel lines. Um, I'm not going to do the whole thing. We'll just look at the solution. But what did you find in the end after you went through all that work? What was the conclusion? So what ended up happening with this line is you should have found that there was no point of intersection, okay? So I went through the same set of steps, you know, I equated in this case here, two and three, solved for S and T, but when I checked the X components, I didn't get the same value. So that means that the value of S and T that make the Y and Z components the same, don't make the X components the same. So the conclusion is that the lines are skewed. Okay, so in this case here, it actually just says determine the intersection. I didn't even have to say that the lines are skew. I could have just said there's no intersection. However, if the question says, you know, uh, determine the nature of the relationship between these two lines, then I'd have to specifically either use the word skew, which we've just defined as meaning not uh, parallel, no point of intersection, or I'd have to explain that out. All right. So. Let's uh, take a look now at intersection of a line and a plane, all right? And we've actually seen how to solve this before. We actually solved a question which I would say is even more complex than this one here. We looked for other types of points of intersections that involved, uh, that involved the line. Does anybody remember what we uh, were looking for? I think in that question there, we were just looking for the number of points of intersection. Anybody remember what we were uh, considering along with the line? No? Well, what we did is we considered a sphere. All right, exactly, it was a sphere. And we considered, you know, how many times does a line intersect a sphere? And we kind of reasoned out that, you know, the line might never intersect the sphere, could be just tangent to the sphere, okay? So it intersects only once, or it can go straight through, 
in which case it would intersect twice, you know, goes in, comes out. So if you remember how we solved that problem, that should give you a sense as to how we would solve uh, this one here. So any uh, suggestions as to what we would do? And usually when you're working with a line, this is usually your first step. There you go, is you look at this equation here, okay? And it's not given in vector form, even though there is something here that does represent a vector, the normal vector. But what you have is you have X, Y, and Z, you know, sort of existing independently within that equation. So if you were to just write x, y, and z written independently, in other words, in parametric form, you can then do an easy substitution. So this is one of these cases where, and usually when you're not dealing with, you know, just uh, intersections of lines, often substitution comes into play more than elimination. So here, if I consider x is equal to 1 plus 2t, and then y is equal to negative 6 uh, plus 3t, and then z is equal to negative 5 plus 2t, I can now use these individual definitions of x, y, and z and input them into the equation of the plane. So we have 4 times 1 plus 2t minus 2 times negative 6 plus 3t. Um, uh, sorry, plus z, which is negative 5 plus 2t minus 19 is equal to zero. And what type of equation is this? It's a linear equation. And what are the possibilities for solutions for linear, a single linear equation? Well, we have one, yeah, we have none, Yep, there's one more. Or you could have infinitely many solutions, okay? So now you might want to try to think back to, you know, to grade 9. I don't know, maybe, maybe you wouldn't have seen it in grade 9. Yes, maybe yes, maybe no. But, you know, likely in grade 10 it would have come up. What would it look like if you have no solutions or infinitely many solutions? But let's just keep going here. So let's just solve this. So again here, 4 plus 8t plus 12 minus 6t minus 5 plus 2t minus 19 equals 0. So if we look at the t's, we had 8 minus 6 is 2 plus 2 is 4. Then here we have 16 minus 5 is 11 minus 19. 11 minus 19 is, I guess, negative 8, right? T is negative 2. Did I do that right? It will uh, equal uh, 8, though, right? Because you, if you brought it to the other side. Negative 8. Oh, thank you. Good, good. Show. See, this is why I tell you, folks, always keep track of what I'm doing. Okay, so it was negative 8, but of course I'm bringing it to the other side, so positive 8, thank you. And there we go. So the fact that this equation has a single solution for t, okay, means, you know, seems to indicate that there's one point of intersection. And of course, what am I going to do with this t equals 2? What's the easiest way to get my point now? There you go. Yeah, just use the point. yeah. and I'm going to plug it into my uh, parametric equation. And then if I want, I could take that point and make sure it's also on the plane if I want to. Okay, so here x is equal to negative 1 plus 2 times 2. So it is that negative 1 plus 4 is 3. Y is equal to negative 6 plus 3 times 2. So it's negative 6 plus 6, that looks like 0, and z is negative 5 plus 2 times 2. So negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1. So it looks like my point of intersection is 3, 0, X, negative 1. x is positive 1, not negative uh, 1. Negative 5. It's 1 plus 2t, not negative 1 plus 2t. 
So you'd end up with five instead. Am I looking here? Where am I no, looking at? Yeah, at the X. The X. R is one, right? Oh, oh, thank you. One plus two T. I don't know where I got the negative from. I guess all these other negatives are. Yeah, good show. So one plus four is five. Very good. So sorry about that. That'll be five, zero, negative one. Okay. Remember what I've told you folks. I think day one, you're almost 90% 90, 90 of your, uh, of your uh, mistakes will be sign errors. And I just made two of them here. Okay. So I guess I'm proving my own rule. All right, so there we go. Now you have, and you know, this is actually probably the easiest of all the ones that that uh, that we're going to see is intersection of line and plane. Okay, so quickly do uh, number five. Okay, and then if you have time, start considering this other question. I'm not sure why I'm asking you this, but I figure let me throw it in at the very end. Okay, so uh, let's give you, uh, I don't think, yeah, three minutes max. All right, so we're back. Um, so what was the result here? What ended up happening with this line and this plane? Now, what did you see? Like what ended up happening that told you there was no intersection? How were you able to tell? So last time we were able to tell because we checked two X values, they weren't the same. Uh, you ended up with what we call a contradiction is you followed all those rules that the math people told you to follow. And in the end, you got to something that did not make sense. That was a contradiction. So that means your original assumption that there was a point of intersection must have been wrong. So that's how this idea of proving something by contradiction is you start with an assumption and that assumption is that this line and this plane have some sort of intersection and you turn up to something like, you know, in this case here, negative eight equals zero, okay? What do you think you would have seen that would have told you there was infinitely many solutions? What kind of thing would you have seen for there to be infinite? You would have seen zero equals zero, five equals five, 10 equals 10. When is five equal to five? When is zero equal to zero? It's always, it's always equal. So that means regardless of what value of T you take, you're always going to get something that's true. Okay. So here, you know, if you take a look, you realize, okay, uh, the way I had it is that zero T is equal to eight. That's never true. That means there's no point of intersection. Okay. But had I gotten to zero T equals zero, that's always true for any value of T. That means any T I input here would work as a point of intersection. So there would have been infinitely many points of intersections. In other words, the plane, the line on the plane. Okay. Now, remember when we were working with the lines, we said, well, you know what? If it's kind of not bad information to know beforehand what group it falls into. So here, if we want to determine when a line and a plane are parallel, well, if a line and a plane are parallel, What's the easiest thing to see in this equation? What piece of physical information can you get just by looking at the Cartesian equation of a plane? Um, the Cartesian equation contains like a line that's normal to the, uh, what's it called, the plane? Yeah. So if, it, if the line and the plane were parallel, then taking the dot product, of the um what's it called the line so, and then the this like the normal line would give you zero okay so this is where you've got the right idea but what i want to do is i want to replace your use of the word line with vectors okay because what we see here the one four two represents the normal vector to the plane and what you were saying is that, well, if the plane and the line are parallel, well, a vector that's perpendicular to the plane is also going to be perpendicular to the line. So when you're taking this dot product, you're not taking it between lines, you're taking it between these two vectors. So if you take the dot product with the normal vector and the direction vector of the line, those should be perpendicular to each other. 
the dot product should be zero. And when we test it out on this one here, we see that, yeah, there you go. The dot product was zero. Uh, so, you know, we know that the line and the plane are parallel. Now, there's an argument to be made that, well, don't I have to do all this work anyways? What's the point of doing this? And, you know, in the end, I still have to do all this work. What if I told you that I thought if you could show that they were parallel to each other, you actually don't have to do all this work to determine whether there's no point of intersection or infinitely many points of intersection. Because remember, when you have a line and a plane that are parallel, you actually have two options. Why don't you have to do all that work to determine which of those two options it's going to be? Can anybody see something that you could do if you knew that they were parallel, why could you avoid doing all this work? Can anybody see how you could avoid having to do all that work to determine whether they're parallel and distinct or whether the line is on the plane? So I can give everybody a, I'm not gonna go away there, but I'll just give everybody like 10, 15 seconds to think about it. Why do I not necessarily have to? So Samia's got an interesting idea, but I don't think that's what you're plugging in. I think you're right about plugging something in, but I don't think that's the correct thing. Well, let's take a look here. If the line and the plane are parallel and distinct, how many points of intersection do they have? None. If the line and the plane, if the line is on the plane, there's infinitely many points of intersection. That means every point on the line has to also be on the plane. Does that give you any ideas about what I could do? There you go. But I don't need to check if the line is on the plane. What's, what's the only thing I have to check? There you go. Is I could take the point on this line, okay, which by looking at the equation would be 0, 1, negative 4. Okay, because this is like x minus zero, you know, y minus one, z minus negative four. And if that point is on the plane, then they all have to be on the plane. And if that point is not on the plane, then there can't be any intersection. Of course, I can only make that determination if I've already checked that they're per, uh, parallel to each other. So let's test it out here. Let's put x equals zero, so zero, plus four times one is four, okay? Plus two times negative four, it's negative eight. So four minus eight is negative four minus four. Does that equal to zero? No, okay? So if I show that they're parallel to each other and that there's one point on the line that's not on the plane, it means none of them can be on the plane, okay? So just some alternatives here. But what's nice about it, this is what's great about mathematics, is that even if you do, don't do that other work to you know, check parallel, blah, 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 if you just go about your business and do the algebra, the algebra shall give you the answers you need, okay? So are there, so that's the end of today's lesson.